everyone. Welcome back to another live q and I'm here with Chanel Rosenbaum, one of the immigration lawyers here at Holthy Immigration Law. And this is the Canadian Immigration Institute's Immigration Live Q&A. And in this case, our Express Entry Live Q&A. Lots of stuff going on with Express Entry, isn't there, Alicia? Uh, Chanel, sorry. I got Alicia yeah. joining me tomorrow, <laughs> so I've got Alicia on the brain. It's, uh, Lots yeah, of interesting it's things. A big week with us switching over to the new NOC tier system. So definitely some changes. Everyone's having to get their profiles updated. There's a lot going on. There's new categories eligible now for Express Entry. So it's exciting. Yes, it is. Well, we'll wait for a few people to kind of connect in here as the uh, as the system goes live. It's great to have our frequent followers. Mariana, it's good to see you. She's giving Chanel a shout out Hi, here. Mariana. Excellent. Um, one thing as we as we shout out to uh, give a few more shout outs here. Make sure like Fernando and Mar Mariana who are saying hello. We love to say hi to you guys. Let us know where you're tuning in from. It's always interesting to see where people are watching um, all over the world. So make sure that you do that. Uh, those of you who are new to the channel, this live Q&A is designed to give you helpful information on your immigration journey. And we like to think there's not too many, too many uh, out there, immigration lawyers doing what we're doing here, but it's all designed to give you guys a little bit of a nudge in the right direction. Now, if you have a very specific question and you um, have all of these personal details that you're sharing, that really is bridging on the area of, immigrate, uh, of an immigration consultation. So we don't like to give legal advice out there for the most part because we just need to understand your whole situation. And in order to do that, we will hit this little button right here. That's a quiet button. Let's turn it up here. So that little triangle is kind of a symbol that you should really book a consult because that situation is just too specific for us to address here in our live Q&A. With that being said, the more general question you have that can benefit all of the listeners that are watching, then absolutely post those. All right, let's see who else we've got here. Simran Jot, hello, good to see you. We've got Ashok here. Uh, Camilla, hey Camilla, how's it going? Thanks for connecting in. I was meeting with Camilla just this morning. So uh, great to have you. She says, hello, Mark and Chanel. Uh, let's see, we've got Rex EMR. Hey, Mark and Chanel, this is Raj from Muscat. Cool, excellent. Um, let's see here. Let's see. And uh, Mar Mariana is asking this question. We could probably address this one. So what do you think, <laughs> Chanel? <clears throat> um, any wild guesses at today's score for the draw considering, well, with the advan you know, the changes within tier, there's a few new positions that weren't otherwise yeah. eligible that could be now. But um, what are your thoughts on the rounds of invitation yeah. here? There are a few new positions that are eligible, but there were also a couple that have become ineligible. So I don't know that that's going to affect the score too much. Um, I'm thinking it's probably going to be only a couple of points lower than last time's draw. Um, so looking maybe at four, four, nine, two, the problem is it's going to slow down a little bit now because we've gotten into the range where most of the candidates really are sitting um, who are eligible in particular under CEC. Um, so here there's a lot of candidates in the next sort of bracket, meaning we'll probably only be decreasing by a point or two in each draw. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I don't think we're going to be dropping below 490, that's for sure. If you look at the number of people that were in the draw, so between 491 and 500, and obviously not all of them were drawn, because the cutoff was 494, but <clears throat> just a little bit under half of them. And maybe they're heavily weighted to the bottom section because the previous mm -hmm. draws, you know, the upper 490s were already flushed out. So maybe more of these are in the lower range. But even if we said, you know, we know that the draw uh, was 4,750. So when you add up everyone over 600, so we've got over 2,000 right there. And then they pulled the balance through here. So there's probably still 2,000 that was sitting in here and um, at least probably. Yeah. And then when you factor in like, you know, like our, our, uh, our subscribers here and followers like Marianne identified, there is some um, expectation that people who, who didn't qualify otherwise would be in there. But the question is, the ones that are moving from, a, uh, from basically the old NOC C to tier three and eligibility do they really have 491 
you know, CRS points. It's highly unlikely that they do. So those are there more often than not there, they tend to be down in this range. So I don't know how much the, the new tier shift for occupations going up is going to impact on this, but it is possible if they have French or other, you know, Canadian work experience, they can get some extra points. So it is possible. So we'll just see how that plays out. But okay, so after looking at this, Chanel, then what do you think the draw is going to be today? I'm still going to go with 492. I think so that's 492. my 492. Okay. I feel like that's a safe bet. Yes, I think that's probably accurate. Now, last week, I think you said 493, right? And I said 492, I think it was. I'm trying to remember what it was. You were closer I than I was, I think. I. Yeah, I think I was around this mark. I'm I'm basically betting each week that it decreases by two points. So yes, I was gotcha. probably close to here last week, last time. Okay. Well, I'm gonna go. Um, I'm gonna assume that they're probably not going to do a larger draw than you know 47.50. So I think I'm actually gonna rest with you at 492. So there you go. There's a <laughs> lot of discussion there, Mariana, to answer your question, but I think we're settling on about 492. Okay. <laughs> Hello from amongst us himself. Well, that's great. <laughs> okay. So those of you who are posting your questions, hold off on your questions. We're going to give a few more shout outs. Make sure that you absolutely tell us where you're tuning in from. Um, and uh, we will definitely go through and we'll get to all of those questions. Uh, we've got Nav Navdeep, who's over in Kitchener, Ontario. Great to see you. Uh, we've got Bruce. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, no, let's see. This is Nisha Richards. Hello, Mark. Maybe it's nice. Nice, to see, nice yeah. to see you have company today. Yes. Joining from Toronto. And Chanel, where are you right now? I'm in Toronto. Indeed. And it's finally really sunny here. It was freezing cold last week and snowed a lot. And I'm really excited that the weather's it's not warmed up too much. But I'm currently sitting here in the sun and it feels really warm inside. Yes, exactly. Um, we've had nothing but a strong wind blowing from the mountains here in Lethbridge, Alberta, and it's melted all of our snow and the temperature is, is warmer. Let's see, I'll do the temperature check here, you guys. Okay, in the fine city of Lethbridge, we are currently sitting at a whopping, uh, if you can see this, three degrees. Kind of got a little bit of a, whoa, let's get over here, see if it'll actually pull it. Probably not. Anyways. Three degrees here. So that's better than minus 20. So we'll take it. All right. Let's see here what we have. So there's lots of questions that people are asking about tier, but let's see who else is tuning in from different locations. And um, and we will get to all those questions, whether you're watching on Facebook, the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group, the Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook, like Tahir here. Hello, Tahir, who's over on that, watching on Facebook. And then we've got a lot of YouTubers uh, to hear is also uh, from Pakistan. So thanks for connecting in. We've got Sophie over in Kenya on the YouTube. Uh, Angie's up in Edmonton. Angie, I was just up there this weekend, going up there with my daughter and my wife to look for a grad dress for high school. So my daughter, the youngest, is in grade 12. And um, yeah, that was, uh, they were in the West Edmonton Mall, uh, Angie, looking for grad dresses. And I was in the host hotel writing this book that is way more involved than I anticipated on the PR economic programs in Canada. So uh, Andrew uh, Carvajal, my co-author, he's way ahead of me. <laughs> and so I've got lots of work to do on getting this book completed. And it's going to be a, um, a legal text that is used for the purposes of um, uh, the immigration consultant program and other practitioners across the country. So we will see how that all plays out. All right, Amit's back as always from Virginia. Good to see you. And um, <laughs> and then Sashin's apologizing. You don't need to apologize, Sashin. He says, sorry, my bad, without any greeting. I just posted my question. Good morning, Mark and Chanel. I joined from Toronto. Awesome. So we've got a pretty good Toronto connection there and uh, it makes sense. It's noon okay. there. So lots of people are not having to skip out of their work, Chanel, to join us. Now, Perfect. before we jump into questions, there's a couple things that we wanted to cover. And one of them is, uh, is this right here. So Chanel is going to come and she's had a real good run of success here with postgrad work permit applications. And um, there are some common problems that people find themselves in when they're applying for their postgrad work permit 
when maybe they didn't fully comply with their obligations on their study permit. So Chanel, do you want to chat a little bit about that? Kind of set the stage for what you see yeah. a lot of, and then uh, some good success here that that uh, that you've had. Yeah, so normally a postgraduate work permit application should be very straightforward, as long as you've complied with all of the conditions of your study permit. Um, but there are a lot of cases where it's not so straightforward, especially at the moment coming out of the pandemic, because a lot of students were affected by the pandemic and it resulted in them not necessarily complying. Um, and by that, I mean taking breaks from school or um, studying part time rather than sticking to full time. Um, there's even been cases where you know, circumstances outside of their control have prevented them from fulfilling their, their study obligations. Um, so I've had one client recently who had an issue with his visa, couldn't get back into Canada and couldn't complete his in-class portion. Um, so some sort of labs he had to be there for and therefore had to drop a couple of subjects, although was enrolled in initially full time, could not complete the semester full time. Um, and then during the pandemic, there's illness, there are the stresses, you know, mental well-being and physical stresses that come from COVID, which have impact on a lot of people. So we've had a lot of clients come to us recently um, who haven't met these conditions and have either tried applying for their postgraduate work permits, but had them denied um, or are trying to be proactive and seeking advice before they apply which is what we would recommend because once you are denied once, it always becomes more difficult to rectify that. So um, we have had some successes and recently I had some good news from a client who was approved for her postgraduate work permit, even though she had both issues where she had actually taken a leave from studies plus um, had been part time in one of her semesters. Um, but we were able to explain this quite thoroughly to IRCC and really provide the evidence they needed to be assured that she didn't intend for it to play out that way. She was otherwise a good student and uh, they were lenient and approved her, which was great to hear. Chanel's identified something that we do in the firm all the time, and that is being proactive. So I know for a fact out there in all of your groups in internet land, uh, whether it's WhatsApp or YouTube or whatever it is, Facebook groups, <clears throat> there's lots of people that tell you just to keep your mouth closed and don't say anything about it. And hopefully IRCC won't notice. And I know that there's probably some of you who followed that path and nothing bad happened, but it's still misrepresentation and there's still potential that it can come back to get you later. And even if it didn't, there, you have an obligation to answer everything within your application in a way that it is true, complete, and correct. And um, we have always taken the position that if you provide an explanation and if you do it correctly, that you're gonna significantly increase your chances of getting through safely, like Chanel's client, mm -hmm. um, when we're honest and forthright. And so when I think about this, the days when I worked on the border as an officer, I'll give you an example here. So. Often when we worked there, when I was on the border, there was a, still a split. I'm an old man now. So there was still a split between the customs officers who dealt with the importation of goods and immigration. So the immigration officers actually worked on the border and I was an immigration officer. So we dealt with the people. So the customs, if they felt like they wanted to refer someone up for a secondary examination, we had a little office in the second level of this, this uh, small little building in the Southern Alberta um, border crossing with Montana and the individuals would come up and one of the questions whenever we were doing you know routine examination we would always check criminal records because we had access to the NCIC database and so we uh, in those days we had those old dot matrix printers and you remember those of you who are old enough these printers had this manual feed with the holes in the side and they made a lot of noise when they were printing and so we had our offices and we would bring the person in for, you know, a more confidential interview. And the first question we would ask them, have you ever been convicted of a felony or misdemeanor in the U.S.? Have you ever been arrested, fingerprinted, spent any time in jail? I would ask everything because they'd always find some reason to say, well, you never asked this. So I would ask them everything. And then the person, um, before they entered the room with me, would have given their ID to another officer who would then run the search while I was conducting the interview. 
And they'd say, no, no, never, never. And then in the side of my ear, I'd hear this bzz, 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 as these pages are being printed off and they're attached with perforations in this accordion kind of style. And so the, this long, long sheet would come and the other officer would come in and set it on, on my desk. And then I'd look to the person and I'd kind of lift up the sheet and I'd say, are you sure you've never been convicted of anything? And I can tell you the people who said yes and disclosed, often maybe there was no issue, right? Maybe the, you know, everything had been resolved. Um, but the people that disclosed, I treated them a whole lot different than someone who I felt was trying to conceal something. And that's exactly what happens when you file your postgrad work permit. If an officer has to dig and they find something that they feel like you concealed or didn't um, disclose like you were supposed to, well, then what happened? There was uh, definitely a lot less leniency on the part of the officer. And that's the same for the immigration officers. When you're forthright, they say, oh, you know what, Chanel's client, I can trust you. So, um, you know, I know that I can, uh, uh, you know, that the other information, if you're disclosing this, then the other information is also going to be, um, uh, it's going to be accurate. So that's the approach that we take. Anything else you'd like to add to Chanel? I've got my, um, my computer here. I've got this, it's p trying to pull in my camera. I'm going to disconnect here. Apparently now your iPhone can connect to this new update on the Mac. And so it keeps wanting to do that. So hopefully it's not going to wreck our screen here. But anyways, you go ahead if you got some other other things to add. Yeah, I was going to say when you mentioned misrepresentation, that actually brings up a really good point with the postgraduate work permit. Um, a lot of applicants who are applying for the postgraduate work permit but haven't quite met the conditions of their study permit have had to extend their study permit already at some point. If they've missed a semester, obviously they're looking to graduate later than originally planned. Now, when you apply for that extension of your study permit, that's a very streamlined process. Um, it's not that difficult and usually is, is approved pretty streamlined from IRCC side, um, meaning at the time, if you didn't disclose, for example, any work experience you did when you were on a break from school that is actually unauthorized, um, or if you didn't disclose any of those changes at that stage, you probably would still have been approved for your study permit. It, it's unlikely it would have been caught at that at that stage, but that's still a form of misrepresentation if it wasn't if it was something that you should have disclosed that you did or failed to do. Um, so that's why at the postgraduate work permit stage, it's really important to go back, if, especially if you failed to disclose it back then, make sure you address it, bring it to their attention that it was an honest mistake that you didn't know at the time. Um, and that's really a scenario that we would encourage you to book a consultation for mm -hmm. to make sure you're addressing any of that previous misrepresentation or just innocent mistakes that could catch up with you later. Perfect. So yes, rule of, th rule of thumb, <laughs> and it's more than a rule of thumb, it's our strong, <laughs> strong advice to you is to really, really make sure that you're proactive. And um, when you're disclosing things, because ultimately you want to have the officer on your side. And yes, there's a risk to that. You could get a jerk officer that says, oh, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you and I'm gonna refuse your application. That's a possibility. But you don't wanna be in a situation where an officer says, oh, I found this, you didn't disclose it. That's misrepresentation. I'm gonna bar you from Canada for five years. And realistically, your dream of being in Canada is gone. So, excellent. Okay, let's see here. Um, let's jump here back to our, uh, there we go. We'll clear this one off. Okay, let's jump to some questions here, Chanel. And I'll get Chanel to help me a little bit with some of these questions. Um, and uh, okay, so I'll just start off here with Sash. And he says, hi, Mark, I just completed my one year of Canadian work experience. And I also do have cell pip. And when I tried to create a profile and submit it to the pool, at the same moment, I got a decision as ineligible. Okay, so Sasha, and one thing we know as they've rolled over into the new tier system, there is a considerable amount of mess within the, the express entry portal. So lots of people are getting lots of weird things like spouses, work experience is not being recognized. Um, in some cases, the people that are kind of midstream with ITAs you know, there it says NOC 2016 in one place, and it's asking for the tier, uh, the tier system for you to change your NOC code. And there's people that are having trouble logging in who try repeatedly. So, 
I would give it a week to, to, to kind of sort through. And I know people are like, oh, I have to get it fixed today before the draw. And that's true if you're, you know, you have to do what you can. But the system has really been quite overrun. We knew it was coming. And so it's not surprising that, uh, that sometimes those issues arise. But Sasha, in your case, um, when it comes to why you get a decision that's ineligible, it may also be that you're not or that you entered something improperly and, uh, and that has then deemed you to be ineligible. I've also seen people who are, who are getting credit um, for their Canadian work experience, but even after two or three months, it's showing that they're eligible for CEC. So these are all these things that we're seeing right now, and it's going to take some time for it to sort out. Uh, the Canadian Bar Association and, and uh, CELA and the other organizations have been providing lots of feedback back to IRCC about all the glitches because that's how they roll. They roll things out early with a little beta test, and then you guys become the guinea pigs. So um, I'd encourage you to continue reporting to IRCC any of these glitches. But Sashin, I recommend you do this. Book a consult with Chanel and uh, and have her go through and, and figure out exactly why you're being deemed ineligible, whether it's a computer glitch or whether it truly is something within your profile that would make you ineligible. And there are things, you know, you didn't indicate what your CELPIP scores were. If your work experience sometimes is at a skill level, the old skill level A or a tier, a tier two, um, then uh, if, you're, if your CELPIP scores are not high enough at a CLB7, then possibly that could be a reason. So um, we're just speculating here, Sashin, but definitely I strongly can uh, recommend that you book a consult. And if we slide over to our site, I, this is a good segue. I want to, for those of you who are watching overseas, um, this Friday at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, I am doing a special webinar and it's by registration only. So you can click on the link. If you go to our firm website, holthelaw.com, um, you then will see this pop-up where you can click on to register. And when you register for the, the um, it's my top three tips to avoid disaster with study permits. And uh, Chanel also is going to be a little bit of a part of that, uh, that presentation. She does a lot of our study permits within the firm. It'll be about an hour uh, roughly. Um, and uh, yeah, you can register. And then right about 15 or 20 minutes before, we go live, then you can watch your email and we will be sending out the link for you to connect in and join with us. Um, this is all a part of and a lead up to our study permit course, which is uh, the master class is starting December the 12th and the course material and everything will be available all the way until, um, uh, well, it will be available starting December the 1st, but I want to point out that there will also be, um, when you subscribe, a bonus, which is a visitor visa course for free. So check that out. And if you register now, pre-register through the pre-sale um, before December the 1st, you get it for 200 US instead of 250. So that's a $50 savings. So we'll just point that one out to everybody. All right, let's go to our next question. Uh, okay, this one is from Rex. He says, I'm sitting with 489 and I have not included my wife's education points. Should I get the ECA done or should I wait for the next one or two draws? So 49, I think that's an easy question. Chanel, what do you think? So I, I would, I mean, I would actually just wait for the next couple of draws because I think you're going to get there before you get the ECA. Um, you're very close. That's probably two or three draws away and the, actually ordering the education assessment, waiting for it can take so six to eight weeks. It's a really long time. So yes. in a couple of drawers, if it doesn't look likely, then you could order it, but I wouldn't waste the money right, right, right now. All right. Okay, let's zip to Among Sus here. He's got a question. My PCC from Armenia doesn't have the full title in the heading. It just says certificate. Is that normal for some other PCCs as well? Okay, well, let's slide over here and let's just take a look. So if we pull up PCC... IRCC will do EE, um, how to get a police certificate. Let's go check and see specifically what it says here. Close that one. So let's go here to Armenia, right here. And this is, I hope, where you're going. <laughs> Find out how to apply. The first thing that it says is the name of the document you need is criminal record certificate. So I, you know, obviously individuals from different locations, um, you know, if it's a consulate or if it's a local office, there may be some variations to it, but I treat this very seriously. 
because that's what the officers are looking for, a document that says criminal record certificate right at the top. And you can see here um, how to apply. It gives you instructions online or in person. Um, and you can give a representative a power of attorney. Police certificates must indicate all names you've used while in Armenia. And the embassy only accepts original police certificates. So printouts of online search results and electronic certificates are not acceptable. And then contact information. So the consular department, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Armenia. So when I look at your question here, so you've, you've indicated that your certificate just says certificate. Well, I can't answer specifically because I haven't had a client go through with an Armenian police clearance certificate, but this instruction from IRCC says criminal record certificate. So I would be doing your investigation to see if there is something else and if the one that you got is actually going to be good enough. So keep that in mind. All right. Okay, so let's keep zipping through here and uh, let's get to our next question. This one is from Ashok. And he says, exactly when can I claim siblings points after his landing in Canada after his COPER? And how soon can he get his PR card after landing in Canada? Please reply. So one of the issues that we have, um, immigration sets out the rules for what they expect to see when you're providing proof. And one of the greatest places to go is the IRCC completeness check website. So all you have to do is type in IRCC complete this check website or just completeness check and it will take you right here to the program delivery instructions which are the these are the um uh, the ones that the officers use to determine what documentation is required so let's see if we can go here i'll see if family let's see uh sibling i wonder if that works nope what is it uh, okay, I'm just going to manually scroll down to the bottom here. I was going to do a quick search. I always struggle with finding the right ones. A divorce, other documents. There we go. Okay, relative apparently is what they want. Or brother or sister. Okay, so you can see here, these are the specific instructions that IRCC asks you to provide uh, when you, to meet when you are providing the information. And here's the document requirements right here. So they need a copy of both sides of the family member's Canadian citizenship document. Canadian birth certificate, if they're citizens, or permanent resident card. And what does it say here? Must be provided. So if we we're to just take that and we shift back to the question that you guys have right here, um, Ash Ashok, you said exactly when. Well, if you want it to be 100% safe, you would actually wait till the person received their permanent resident card. You need to provide their residence, proof that they actually are residing in Canada, and the sibling relationship. So birth certificates showing you know, com, you know, mutual parents um, or a parent. And so um, when people ask, okay, how soon? Well, could you get by with just the confirmation of permanent residence? Well, maybe, maybe, but I don't want to take that chance. So if you are wanting those 15 points and they're essential, I don't want to leave it up into the hands of an officer. Um, you know, if they ask specifically for a permanent resident card as, as being the document that must be provided. Now it's possible when you're going through this um, that, um, I'll just flip over here, you can see it's possible that they might accept a confirmation of permanent residence in lieu of a permanent resident card. But boy, when it says must be provided, they're ruthless. And I'll give you an example as we shift back here. Another example is the police clearance certificate rule where it says when you provide a copy of your original police clearance certificate, it needs to be in color. Well, what does that mean? You know, if you have a black and white and it's real and you've scanned it in, does that somehow mean that the black and white is of more validity than the color? Well, for the purposes of immigration, they feel it is. So if you submit a black and white one, they can absolutely reject your application. So um, I don't take any chances, Ashok. And so I recommend that my clients don't either. But is it possible? Maybe. But I don't like to walk right along the edge of the cliff. I like to kind of stay back away from it a little bit. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Um, I think we've got a super that popped in and we gotta treat those guys carefully here. So, okay, and Jan says, um, is it possible to miss out putting the knock code while filing the EAPR? I don't remember having put a knock code as it seems to have been transmitted already. 
um, the, the, the reality Chanel, you want to tackle that one? Well, it should, um, it should pull the knock code across from your profile, but when you fill in your work experience, you'll fill in which, which knock code each, each job was tied to, because some people have multiple knock codes. So there should be a requirement to enter it when you're filling out your work experience. Yes. So I just did an express entry review this morning and um, the client had an ITA. And what we noticed when we were completing and updating her information, that um, when you roll over from uh, the NOC 2016, when you got your ITA until now, the work history, if you're looking at it just the way it is and you haven't, and you, you updated it and there's nothing that you have to update, it still shows as a green check mark. In other words, that that section has been completed. Why? Because all of the information you put in your profile is being carried over to your EAPR. But here's the interesting thing. I always go back through and look at everything every time I work directly with our clients when they hire us to represent them. I went through and looked at the, the work history with the client and that section related to not code was blank. So on her form, it's still referenced the four digit knock code. But when we looked at the drop down menu, it was five digits. And then when we updated her EAPR, it then rolled into the five digit knock. And so then everything was consistent at that level. But there's gonna be a lot of headache going on. But when it comes to um, work history, if you're one of those people who received an ITA in the last couple months and you haven't yet filed your EAPR, and you are getting ready to do it, go back and take a look at your work history because they will ask you to update to the five digit knock when you submit your EAPR. So take that into consideration. Okay, good question, Jen. Okay, uh, Jacobs says, does maternity leave in Canada count towards stay in Canada on PR status? Does maternity leave in Canada count towards stay in Canada on PR status? Hmm, not quite sure I understand what that question Wait, is. Alicia, uh, I think, Chanel? I, I think he might be asking if it counts towards your residency requirement to maintain your PR status, in which either that or whether it counts towards work experience for Canadian experience class. Yeah. So for PR status to maintain your residency, um, you need to meet the residency requirement by being physically present in Canada. It does not That's matter it. if you're working or not. You can be unemployed, you can be on maternity leave, you can be studying, whatever it is. Um, but for Canadian experience class, if you're trying to claim points for work experience, uh, they do require that 12 months or more of work experience. And if you're on extended leave for whatever reason, that normally wouldn't count towards the work experience. Um, so you need to be physically working during that time to accrue the 12 months. Yes. All right. Next question. Okay. This one is, uh, Navdeep says, do we need to get our old experience letter updated to the new knock codes? My old employer is not replying to my emails. So technically in the employment letters, the employer does not need to mention the knock code. So the old employment letters should be fine for the, the new NOT codes, as long as your job, you know, your, your NOT code is very similar, most of them are. Um, if you seem to have changed job position, you, you think is actually a different NOT code now, and that old employment letter um, doesn't seem to match up well enough, you could get an updated one, but really they should still apply and uh, there's no need to specify the NOT code. Even if your employer did mention the old NOT code, I wouldn't see that as an issue. Yeah, not a big deal. All right, Yusuf says, hey, Mark, do you think there will be a huge drop in today's draw because people were too late in changing their NOC codes? No, I don't think so. Um, I think most people will be able to get in uh, and anyone who's diligent would be trying to log in 24-7. So I really don't think there's going to be a huge drop with people updating their NOC codes. But who knows? Maybe the government will realize, oh, there's lots of issues with the portal now. And maybe you guys, they will choose to delay the round of invitation, which is entirely possible. We've seen that in the past. Those of you who remember draw 176, they actually didn't do one during the week. They waited until that Saturday. 
And so um, that was February. When was that? February the 7th or, oh, I can't remember. It's all a blur. Anyways, 27,332 invitations extended on that February 13th draw. And so anything can happen. And if they sense there's problems within the portal, which there are, um, it's entirely possible that they could even delay the draw. So let's just see how that plays out. Okay, next on our list here is Angie. She says, hey, Mark and Chanel, do you think that the 16 new occupations will be prioritized in the next rounds? So what do you think? Think Minister is going to jump in and, and prioritize these ones that have been bumped up from uh, the old ineligible to now eligible list? I don't think so. I don't think they've been bumped up because they're more urgent than other positions to have come come into Canada. I think they've just been deemed to be required the same as the other positions which are eligible. Um, so I, I think they'll just be treated the same. All right. We've got Gregorio here. Excellent. Gregorio says, hello from Niagara. I took your TR to PR course one and a half years ago. Oh, I'll give you one of these ones. Um, applied uh, English and French stream recent grads. No final answer so far. Yep, very common. Please make a video just for people in this situation. Thanks. Uh, Gregorio, there's not much really to make a video of. Uh, let's see. It says, I've tried to be proactive. It has been quite stressful. What can I do now? What should I expect? My postgrad work permit expires in May 2023. So, Gregorio, this in your situation, this is a classic one of these right here where we recommend that you slide over to our firm and uh, just go to our firm website and you're well aware of it. Um, click on speak to a lawyer and slide down here and click on book a, uh, a consult with Chanel. And you can see, you click on that. Um, Chanel's got availability here. looks like she's filled up here for Thursday, Friday, but Monday she has availability. And so I recommend that you slide over there and book a consult and then we can, uh, we can walk through that with you. Okay. All right. But yeah, there's not much. We know that until 2023, they have the ability to still process these applications because that's what the levels plans are indicating, that they've got room set aside. And so as far as status and all these other things that you're concerned about, consultation is really the best, best way to go. Okay, next item up here. Uh, this is from Sahil. And Sahil says, if someone cannot leave uh, an employer because it's one of the best ones, but they are in Montreal. Is it all door closed for express entry? Most likely. It's Quebec, it does not qualify. They do not participate in express entry. So if you're living and working in Quebec, you wouldn't be eligible. The officers won't believe you have an intention to live elsewhere in Canada. Um, if your employer has an office somewhere else in Canada and would be able to transfer you, that would be your best bet. Um, even if you still do some work with Montreal, as long as you're physically based elsewhere and your you know, workplace, your usual place of work is elsewhere, is outside of Quebec, then uh, you can probably explain that to IRCC and hopefully you would be fine. Good. Okay, Sassy says, hey Mark, I have updated a new knock code, but the points got reduced from 492 to 487. It's not considering spousal Canadian experience, five points. It got reduced from five to zero. Could you please advise? This is a known issue, Sassi, that we've reported back to, to IRCC. And so this is another reason why potentially I could see them delaying the rounds of invitations and not doing one today because of people who are caught in this type of a situation. So we don't have an answer for it. Um, uh, ultimately, this is something that's a known issue that's been reported to IRCC. So we'll just have to see how it plays out. Okay, um, let's jump to our next one. This one is from uh, Satyake Bakshi. Good day, Mark from Toronto here. If I travel outside Canada after submitting my EAPR, is there a chance I would have to provide a PCC again for a two week trip back home? What do you think about this one, Chanel? There's different schools of thought. That's a tough one. I would be inclined to, to say, yes, technically you should be notifying ISCC at least that you've, you've traveled back home and asking if they would like you to submit additional documents. Um, I wouldn't necessarily go ahead and order a new one until they prompt you to, um, but being upfront about it could at least clear it up with them. 
Um, obviously, normally you are meant to submit to the police certificate after the last time you've travelled. Um, it probably depends as well on how long it takes them to process your application. If they go they get close to the 12 months processing times, then yes, they probably would look for a new police certificate. But um, if they're processing it quickly enough, then maybe that they won't need an update on that. Maybe they'll be fine with what you've already provided. I would just recommend notifying them. Okay, next question. This one's from Nisha. Nisha says, do you think there'll be an extension for the postgrads expiring in the first quarter of 2023? What do you think, Chanel? We get asked this question all the time. I, I don't think so at the moment. Just nothing's been announced. And even if they do announce something, just historically looking at what they've done with um, all the applicants who, uh, whose work permits were expiring in 2020, it took so long to finally get there at you know, implementing something that even if they do announce something, I, I don't think it will be for a while. They just seem very unorganized with it. Um, I am just recommending to clients, don't put your eggs in one basket. I wouldn't count on that. If it happens, then great. It's a nice bonus, but I'm not counting on it. Yes. All right. Next question. This is from Chris. Hi, Mark and Chanel. I received an append error on my EE application. It nulled my name status and can't update anything, even my tier code. Should I create another express entry profile? Submitted tech issues, still no reply. Wow, there's a lot of people in this kind of a situation. Um, what would you advise on that one, Chanel? I wouldn't create a new EE profile because you're not allowed to have two profiles in the pool. It's just painful that you're, you're probably going to have to wait for an update. You've submitted, um, you know, you've notified them of the issue. We have notified IRCC of issues that we've seen. I'm, I think they've got a lot of feedback at the moment and hopefully they'll take this into account when they do the next draw. So I don't know if you have additional insight on that, Mark. Yeah. You know, this is always an issue when you're dealing with glitches. So there's a certain period of time where they just have to sort things out. And Chanel's right. People don't understand this, but you're not to have more than one profile in the pool at the same time. It doesn't prevent you from having more than one permanent resident application. You are restricted as well from having more than one sponsorship undertaking in place. But in this situation, it's really, yeah, I recommend, Chris, that you book a consult. We can take a look at it together and try to sort it out. Um, sometimes those errors will sort themselves out when you re-log in and refresh. It's like turning off your computer and restarting, right? Um, but uh, it's hard to tell with this type of a specific situation. So we recommend that you actually do consider booking a consultation. Okay. <clears throat> Anitha says, <clears throat> if, I, if it says CEC met... <clears throat> excuse me, an FSW not met for Canadian education and one year Canadian experience. Is it normal? <laughs> so what is normal these days? Is that normal for you to have one year and let's say you're not eligible? I don't think so. This just, there's no, there's no normal anymore. Um, at least you met it for CC, which is the category you would want to partake in. That's, you know, you have more points for having Canadian experience. So I wouldn't worry about it saying FSW not met. Um, but I would have expected that you should have technically met both of them. Um, I wouldn't stress about that, though. It seems like as long as you're captured in the right category and you know, if you know you're eligible for CEC, then I, I think that's fine. Okay, next question. Um, okay, this one here. <clears throat> this is from Manzur. So Manzur says, I'm planning to travel to the US, <clears throat> excuse me, by road during the holidays. So I'm on a work permit, but no TRV stamp. So I'm assuming, Manzur, that you are coming from a visa required country and that the original visa that used to come to Canada has expired. According to section 193F, of IRPA Act, no TRV needed. Is that correct? Thank you. Okay, so I see this happen a lot. So if we were to go to IRPA Act, and this is the problem because some people don't understand the distinctions between them. Um, well, let's let's just show it's actually, oh, let's slide over here. Okay, do you see this here? So visa exemption, this is referring to the one that's referred here, 193F, but it's the regulations, not the Act. So 193 and if we scroll down here to F, okay, this is the provision. So the provision basically states that 
um, you are exempt from requiring a visa to re-enter Canada following a visit solely to the United States or St. Pierre and Miquelon if they held a study permit or a work permit that was issued before they left Canada on such a visit or were authorized to enter and remain in Canada as a temporary resident and return to Canada by the end of the period initially authorized for their stay or any extension to it. This is one of the provisions that I learned first uh, when I was doing my officer training at the border because you get a lot of people that are doing exactly this. It's called the contiguous country provision. And so based on that regulation, R193F, individuals are able to do that, but I will never tell you, Manzur, that you can travel or that it applies to you the provision, as it's interpreted, and as I showed you here, that is what it says. But there may be other factors that I don't see from your short little statement here. And all I can tell you is book a consult, and we can take a look at it in detail. And, uh, and um, yeah, then I can actually give you legal advice. Okay? <clears throat> all right. Next question. This one is from Nisa. And uh, this kind of... Yeah, this circulate, you know, this this comes around quite a bit. It's all about the arranged offers of employment and getting the extra points, and there's a lot of confusion out there. So Nisa says, knock tier zero with an open work permit. Can I earn points for job offer? And I'm sure this is in the context of express entry. So what do you feel about this one, Chanel? Can, uh, on an open work permit, um, just because now they're knock tier zero, can they get points for a job offer? So the job offer still needs to be a valid job offer, so offer for express entry. Um, you could look at a permanent LMIA with an employer. So an employer who's willing to get an LMIA uh, for you to use for your permanent residency application uh, with the, the promise that you will work for them once you become a permanent resident. Um, so that's something to explore. Um, but your other option to get a, a valid job offer would be looking usually at an LMIA job offer, which would mean moving from an open work permit to a closed work permit, which is a bit of a strange situation. It's, it's not very common to do that. Um, and it, it really depends how much longer you have on your open work permit. If it's going to expire soon, then maybe looking at, at moving on to a closed work permit is an option. All right, let's jump into some other ones here. So this unknown users, I love this, <laughs> uh, in, in YouTube says, will there be no draw today? We don't know. One thing I've pointed out is that there are glitches. And as we looked at other people who've had problems trying to, uh, you know, losing points for spouses, work history, things like that, until they get those resolved, they could just, you know, soldier forward and do it. They can, and they have in the past or they could choose to, to wait a little bit till they sort out the glitches. Either way, there's no guarantees. Okay, here's a police clearance certificate one for you, Chanel. Okay, <clears throat> this is Sarum. He says, hi guys from Toronto. I got my PCC from India on August, 2021. I haven't left India after that. Okay, let's see. Okay, so from Toronto, got his PCC from India on August, the, uh, August 2021. I haven't left India after that, but just a four day trip to the US. Can I still use that PCC for my CEC application now or need a new one? Okay, this is the challenge because we don't know, Sarum. Were you physically present in India on August 2021 when you got it? Or was the police clearance certificate obtained while you're in Toronto and you haven't, <clears throat> haven't returned back to India since it was issued? So Chanel, do you wanna tackle that one? So you would need a new police certificate if since getting your original police certificate, you have traveled back to that country. Um, so you need, uh, you need the police certificate to be after the last time you were in that country. Um, if your current police certificate is only valid till August 2021 anyway, um, the likelihood is throughout the application process, you may need to request a new one because it's not going to be valid for long enough. Um, so I would, uh, if, you, if you haven't been drawn yet, if you are waiting for, for an ITA to submit your application, um, I would wait till you're a little bit closer to feeling confident that the ITA is coming and then order the new police certificate so it's valid for as long as possible uh, once you submit your application. Right. Uh, Miriam says, I got my nomination on the 12th of November with NOC 2173. Yay! 
But I will give you an applause there, Miriam. And I'm almost positive that Miriam likely has a follow-up question. Uh, nope, doesn't. Okay, well, congratulations. I guess they're in order. <clears throat> okay, we've got a couple more here. Um, okay, so it looks like Nijan has a bunch here. I want to try to get context again. So, <clears throat> missed out putting the knock code while failing the EAPR. Don't remember. Um, it just showed complete, and I don't remember any questions with knock code. That's exactly what I said. When we went in there and looked at it, it showed it as being complete. But um, when I went back in and looked at it again anyways, <clears throat> um, then I noticed that it was blank, the section for the knock code. Am I in trouble? It's November the 9th. Date of submission is the 19th of November. Um, submitted, it shows under details in my application provided uploaded file. But under document name says required in red, what does that mean? It means this one right here, Najan. Slide over and go over to our website and click on speak to a lawyer right here and book a consult with us so that we can take a look at that because this is an issue you absolutely need to pay careful attention to. Because <clears throat> one thing you guys don't understand is that the officers don't see the same thing you do. What's on the back end is different than what the officers see or sort of different than what you see on the front end with the user interface. So sometimes they have no clue that these things that are happening um, are actually, you know, uh, that, that they're occurring. So the things that you're seeing on your side, they just don't. So they may very well see, oh, they didn't complete this section. But it should never allow you to submit your application unless everything is correct. So clearly there is a glitch, clearly. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Next up. Okay. Abby's World says, is the LMIA only for people who is already in Canada? So Chanel, and I no. think she missed an eye there, so. Yeah, no, it's not. It's for people applying from overseas as well. Um, it can be more challenging to secure a job in Canada before you get here. Um, so a lot of people secure their LMIAs once they're here on previous work permits or study permits. Um, it, but a, a lot of applicants do come over. If you're in a specialized field um, and there's a skill shortage here in Canada, uh, you very well could secure a position that the employer has an LMIA for and then apply for a closed work permit to enter Canada and, and stay here and work for that employer. Perfect. Okay, let's jump on this follow-up from Sarum. So Sarum says, no, I'm not in India. When I got my PCC, I applied, I applied it from mm -hmm. Toronto. So after getting that PCC, I haven't been to India. Right. Then it should be fine. Then you can use that PCC. Um, but if it expires before you submit your application, you'd need to get a new one. If it's too close to expiring, you would still want to get a new one. So you have as much validity on it as possible. Um, and if you travel back to India, um, then you would want to get a new one. Perfect. Okay. Next up here is uh, Sangini says, Hey, Mark, when can we expect the draws to reach 480s? My CRS is 483. CEC, two years, can I expect ITA before Bill C-19 is executed? Bill C-19 has already long been <clears throat> um, proclaimed into force. So it is law. The minister at any point in time can do it. So um, it's just a matter of what he wants to do. So Chanel, any thoughts on if the minister continued to do no program specified draws, uh, when it would drop down to 480 or if ever? Uh -huh. It's a, I mean, it's just speculation, really, based on the draws, the way it's going. I, I think that 480 is on the horizon. I just um, think it's going to take a, a few more months or at the very least a few more weeks. Um, we'll see what the next draw comes in at, probably in the low 490s, as we've discussed. And then it's just a case each week of uh, each fortnight, sorry, of, of them <laughs> Doing the draws, probably it coming down one or two points. So you you should go through and, and see the stats of how many applicants are in the pool, how many um, you know each each two weeks when the draws are, what the draw is at, and you can do your own maths to to figure out your best estimate of when you expect it will get to uh, 480. That's really what I recommend people mm, do yeah. is monitor it and calculate so you can get a sense of when you should expect an ITA. Remember to keep as many of your options open as possible, you guys. And how do you figure out what all your options are? Slide over <clears throat> and book a consult with us. I also want to point out on our firm website, 
<coughs> excuse me, I'm just going to expand this window a little bit so that you guys can see the top part. So up here, you can see we have our blogs. And you absolutely want to go here and check out all of the most recent blogs. Chanel has, has recently written a number of them. But these blog posts that we've written are all laid out here on our firm site. Everything from changes to tier. And when things happen, there's usually a blog post that we write. And in addition to that, you can also go to our YouTube channel where it's really easy to search even through the... Um, search function right here to pick a topic that you want to learn more about. So if I just type in tier here in search, it will pull up the videos that we did that relate to tier. Okay. And there's a lot of good content. You can see uh, Cedric and, and Chanel did this one on tier and knock eligibility and that flowed off of the blog post that they wrote. So you can search pretty much any topic that you want. There's a wonderfully large database of uh, videos that you guys can access. And uh, they're all easily searchable here on the Canadian Immigration Institute YouTube channel, which I see has recently crossed over 45,000 subscribers. So thank you so much, you guys. Make sure that if you haven't, <clears throat> please come here and, uh, and subscribe. Also, those of you who want to become members, you can join our group where we will have, it's $2.99 a month. You can have access to loyalty badges, custom emojis, and there's a bunch of other member only things that we're going to be doing here. So that option is now available for all of you. Okay, we got another super chat that's come up. Our time is just about up. Let's tackle this one. Okay, um, this one is from, let's jump back here. This one is from... Uh, Simran Jot, he says, is certificate of qualification for teachers valid to receive 50 points or is it only for trade occupations? I can tackle this one. It's only for trade, Simran Jot. So <clears throat> it's only the knock codes that are within the, the various trades, the skilled trades, that and, it, and it's through the federal skilled, um, well, you can get those extra points through the comprehensive ranking system, but it's only for trades. So not as teachers. All right. Uh, let's see if we have anything else here. Um, okay, let's tackle a few last ones. Um, okay, uh, unwanted yawn. Mm, okay. Hello, Mark. Question, I got an ITA, but upon getting my job letter, I realized that the knock I specified barely matches my job duties, only job title. Can I still change my knock code in the application? So this is after an ITA. And um, this one is, uh, if I jump in, really comes down to this here. And we're covering this at length in my, um, in my book. I'm going to flip this over here in the PR book. But it's A11.2 IRCCEE. I'll do the assessment. So here's the program delivery instructions that relate to making changes between the time in which you get an invitation to apply and when you file your EAPR. You have an obligation to identify your primary knock. And can you make a change? Well, potentially you can. If you do it correctly, you can. The key is to show <clears throat> that when an officer is looking at it, the applicant possesses the qualifications that they declared in their EAPR as corroborated by supporting documents and when the client submits their EAPR, the information provided in their profile has not materially changed to the degree that the applicant would not have been issued an ITA. So this transition that they, it's under the Section A 11.2 assessment, that's the act. That is what an officer uses when they're trying to determine if there was a change that would either make you ineligible if you had put that change in your profile or that your CRS scores have somehow dropped, thus that you wouldn't, you know, such that you wouldn't have received an invitation during that round of invitations. And so if you do it correctly, yes, it is possible. Once again, I recommend you slide over and book a consult. All right, couple last minute little things that I wanted to point out. Those of you who are um, study permit <coughs> explorers all over the world, the study permit course is going to be launched, at least the master class, December 12th to the 16th. But we now have a pre-sale open until December 1st, <clears throat> where you can get 50, um, $50 off. 
And I also want to let you know, I'm trying to remember where it is. When I go into our page, let's see if I can pull up Healthy Immigration Law. I'm not even sure if I can pull it up. I did once. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to clear the browsing data. That's what I'm going to do. Look familiar, you guys? Yes, this is how we roll, right? So if I search Healthy Immigration Law, and I'm just going to pull up our firm website. Um, I can't know. I don't know how to find it otherwise. When you go here, come on, pop up. Okay, it doesn't pop up. Okay, in oh there it is. Ha ha! I just had to wait. <laughs> so when you go to our website, you can see that there is a section to register for a webinar that I'm doing this Friday at 8 a.m. That is entitled "Study Permits: The Top Three Tips to Avoid Disaster." And this is a webinar, so it is by registration. And so you can click on this link to register and join me. And uh, Chanel's got a little a little piece in her, there that she's also going to be contributing with. Sh Chanel does a lot of our study permits within our firm. And if you are looking to apply to study or really any type of immigration application, all you have to do is go to our firm, um, our firm site right here, Healthy Immigration Law. It's healthylaw.com is the is the domain or click in the link below and you can click speak to a lawyer and slide down here and book a consultation with chanel all right or and any of I the other lawyers we're all available for study permits as well it's the time now to be pursuing them if you're aiming for the may intake you need to be preparing and submitting your application over the next couple of months so ideally over the holidays um, so that you are in with a chance of it being approved in time for you to get here to start your studies. Yes. And the last little piece I'll point out as well is right now, you can see when you go and you click on the links below, I am in the midst of my spousal sponsorship course. The master class is happening right now. So each evening for an hour, we're spending time answering everybody's questions in addition to all of the on-demand video instruction tutorials that I provide on, on completing this spousal sponsorship. Like I said, the study permit course is, is it, the cart's open right now at the discounted rate. Join me on Friday. But next week, November the 28th to the December the 1st is our another well-recognized um, express entry course that's been around for the longest period of time. And, uh, and you can subscribe right now and join me especially those of you who've got all these issues with tier and you're just confused, you don't know what to do, your portal isn't working, you know, whatever the issues are, these masterclass sessions that I have right here will be a perfect opportunity for you to come together with all of the other students that are registering for this course. And in our live masterclass sessions that we have each evening um, for one hour, we can talk about all those issues and pool all of our experience and knowledge to make sure that you're getting it done right the first time. And all you have to do is click on here. You can learn more and buy the course. That's where you can buy now, but there's a ton of detail here, including testimonials and everything else, as well as a complete breakdown of everything that's in the course. Over 642 minutes, over 10 hours of premium on-demand video content and four hours of live masterclass sessions with yours truly here. And the document section is the one I love the most. But I'll be honest, after the shift from tier, completing the profile uh, here for as the principal applicant and the completing the EAPR is definitely going to be sections that individuals are going to want to pay close attention to. All right. I think that covers it, Chanel. Thanks for joining me today. It was great having great, you. And, and those of you who join late, um, I also want to point out here, let's pull up the topic. Chanel, at the beginning, just go back and watch this as a recording, but Chanel shared a really, really cool um, series of stories, really, about the post-grad work permit problems that some of our clients have had and the success that Chanel's had in getting those post-grad work permits approved, notwithstanding some tricky issues and some elements of non-compliance when they were on their study permits. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Chanel. Thanks. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll see you again tomorrow at uh, 11 a.m. Alicia and I are going to be going live for the Q&A tomorrow. So see you then. And hopefully 